are back and ready, getting ready for our first panel discussion here at the Biostock Life Science Summit 2020. This panel is going to focus on the ongoing pandemic and uh, its uh, impact on healthcare and the biopharma industry from an investor's perspective. And with me today, I have a very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, we will be joined by Matthias Hegblom, who is portfolio manager at uh, the Medica Fund of Swedbank Rober. We also have Klaus Johansson, who is senior portfolio manager at Danske Bank Asset Management. And uh, last but not least, we have Mika Svensson, who is portfolio manager of Healthcare Select Fund at C Worldwide Asset Management. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for joining me, guys. And um, uh, how are you doing? Thanks for having us. And thanks. Doing fine. Great. Yeah, doing well. Great. Uh, we're going to start this uh, session with a short. Uh, short intro from each and one of you. You each have one minute. Uh, we have a sort of a, t a tight time schedule. So how about you start, uh, Matthias? Sure. So, so biologist by training, ended up in the finance industry by coincidence in the late 90s. Spent 18 years as an equity research analyst covering Nordic life science stocks. Um, and then now been five years with Swedbank Gruber managing our global healthcare fund called Medica. Uh, a billion US uh, assets under management, and uh, it's truly global from West Coast in the US to East of Japan. A perfect one minute pitch. Thank you very much. Uh, Klaus, would you like to be next? Yes, um, I'm a senior portfolio manager at Danske Bank as a management, and uh, I've been covering healthcare since 2004, I'm at, and I'm advising our global and European funds within the healthcare uh, segment. I'm also a financial and scientific advisor to a UK-based company called Affinity, and we are advising governments and large banks, hedge funds, on the development of COVID-2 uh, virus and vaccines and also treatments. So I have pretty good insight into what is going on in that market. Sounds good. We're going to make good use of that knowledge today. Uh, Mikael, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I work at Sea Worldwide Asset Management. Uh, for you who, who don't know it, uh, our previous name was Carnegie Asset Management, and we changed name a few years back. Uh, we're headquartered in Copenhagen, where we have our big global uh, fund. And we are 115 employees, 188 billion SEC under management. And I'm managing our healthcare select fund, uh, and we have about 8 billion SEC in that fund, and it's a global all cap fund. We're benchmark agnostic, uh, max 50 holdings in the fund. I've been doing this for 20 years approximately now, and uh, we're two PMs on the fund. We have also Ulf Arvidsson, who is MD, PhD on the fund, and we have a collaboration with the Karolinska eight professors, uh, a scientific advisory board, which we meet uh, four times a year. Thank you. That's uh, quite a few decades of combined knowledge and experience that we're going to tap into today. Uh, I'd like to well jump right in, and uh, the first question would, to you guys would be: uh, How has the global COVID-19 pandemic affected your respective investment strategies? And could you name any concrete changes you've made to your portfolios around March this year? Um, we can start with you, Michael. Yeah, so, so this came all of a sudden and then, you know, the whole market collapsed and uh, uh, we were quite op opportunistic at that time and actually increased our holdings in some of, especially medtech companies that, that were very hard hit like Exact Sciences and Novocure. And, but we never played the direct uh, COVID-19 play through the vaccine companies. I think that's very tough to do because, you know, there are so many players out there and you don't know who's going to win the vaccine race and for how long. So what we did instead was that we actually increased our uh, exposure to the diagnostics company and we bought a, an exciting company called Kaidel. And they were actually leaders in the influenza testing market before COVID-19. And uh, 
now they rapidly developed a lot of COVID-19 testing. So they are now, now cranking out over 2 million COVID-19 tests a week. And they're rapidly increasing production. And they have demand that's four to five times what they can produce currently. And they're not active, look, actively looking for a, a new client. So, and, uh, and if you sp look at that market, I think this is a paradigm shifting for how much testing you will do in the future. You will test a lot more than you did previous to COVID-19, even if we have a vaccine. So slightly opportunistic uh, approach. Uh, Matthias, uh, what kind of uh, changes have you made to your strategies? And uh, did, you, did you also uh, grab any chances when they, when they surfaced uh, earlier this year? Sure. I mean, our, our starting point is we're, we're viewing ourselves as very long term. So, you know, with every every investment decision we make, we tend to think about uh, a three to five year perspective. That said, of course, you know, when market volatility is as high as it was this um, spring in March in particular, um, you know, opportunities emerge and we, um, you know, acquired assets that we probably hadn't thought about acquiring before. And we increased in positions which we liked a lot even prior to but became cheaper, and I, I, um, you know, agree with Mikkel. We haven't we haven't played the COVID nineteen vaccine um, theme as well. We have played, um, you know, testing. I sympathize with the idea. Uh, so we had a lot of, um, um, you know, companies that were exposed to, um, you know, testing, uh, but then they had an underlying <clears throat> business model that we already liked before something came about. Thermo Fisher. Abbott, Hologic, uh, names we happily uh, uh, purchased more stocks in when uh, you know markets collapsed in in, in the spring. Um, you know, then then uh, again back to the long term perspective, we're we're typically interested in business models, management teams, and and the longer horizon. And that uh, although we have a pandemic right now, that doesn't change for uh, you know many of the companies out there. So it's continuous work to look for uh, you know sustainable business models and, and good management teams, then prices uh, can be more attractive at the time you, you buy them. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, what about you, Klaus, uh, Klaus and uh, Danske Bank? What are your assessment and uh, have you made any uh, revolutionary changes to your strategies? Uh, we recently um, changed um let's say, and merged our global funds into a new fund called Global Sustainable Future. So we are measuring and targeting and monitoring companies, how they are doing on an ESG basis. And and um, this is a very concentrated fund, uh, more or less 35 names. And during the pandemic, uh, we uh, evaluated the situation and we thought that the market had a very uh, sharp rebound and that was not uh, a bit expected from our side. But we could see some companies um, lacking, and especially a company called Medtronic that we have uh, followed for many years. They are now in a transition phase with a new CEO, and he is uh, really trying to make the company more agile mm -hmm. and can uh, speed up the organic growth. And we could definitely see that um, having a more, long, let's say, a 24 months view, we could see that volumes in the hospital will come back uh, when we expect the... Mm -hmm. um, U.S. population to be vaccinated uh, during the 2021. So into 2022, we thought that actually the earnings were a bit, uh, let's say, undervalued. So we uh, had uh, we took a position and we have uh, increased that position during um, during the last uh, four months. So it's actually one of the largest uh, positions in our fund, and uh, we also did that because they also have a very strong balance sheet and they could be opportunistic in this environment. So. That is one of the things that we've been doing um, in this um, during this period. We have an indirect exposure to testing through Rose Diagnostics, that is one of the leading companies in the world doing testing. So we have uh, we have some benefit, but it has not been a strategic decision for us just to increase the exposure. We already had a quite a large position in Rose already. Thank you very much, Klaus, uh, and all of you. Uh, interesting to hear your take on this. And uh, so after merely a year in development, uh, within the same week, then uh, several uh, drug makers have um, presented data that uh, seem to show that you have fairly or very effic uh, efficient uh, vaccine candidates coming out. Uh, 
is this going to be the game changer that everyone has been waiting for or is it too soon to call the victory over corona and what kind of implications uh, will uh, a functioning vaccine have from an investor's point of view uh, what would you say uh, matthias well <clears throat> i think um most people would tend to agree that a vaccine in the end of the day will be necessary to, to finally you know, put this pandemic behind us. That said, uh, there will remain many challenges, uh, although we've seen top line data from our two candidates in phase three, uh, challenges in terms of uh, providing good uh, long term safety data, uh, challenges in terms of scaling up at a speed never seen before with mRNA based vaccines that never been commercialized before handling of those, uh, given that they require a uh, cold uh, chain store uh, that um, you know is not re readily available, although there are improvements made in terms of stability data and what have you. And then, you know, of course, uh, an, an already ongoing skepticism among a large portion of uh, the population against vaccines. So the pandemic from that perspective comes at the, at the very uh, you know, unfortunate timing. Uh, so it, it will probably be many tools in the toolbox. Uh, vaccines will probably play a central part in my view, but testing will continue for quite some time. Uh, uh, you know, therapeutics, antibodies in development will be important and lessons learned from the healthcare system to, to better, um, you know, mitigate and, and, and care for those patients who show up in intensive care units. I think a lot have been learned from the first wave in, in this spring. Uh, but uh, you know, I think vaccines is going to be critical to get back to something that we think is normal. Not sure exactly what normal will look like. Yes, and uh, I know you guys have a well fairly global outlook. Uh, but if we were to hone in on and focus on the Nordic region, for example, what what would you guys be on the lookout for right now, or um, which companies are, are likely to catch your eye as investors? Uh, I mean, by category or by all means specific companies, if you'd like to uh, elaborate. Um, uh, let's start with you, Michael. Yeah, so you, as you said, we are a global P portfolio manager. So our exposure to the, to the Nordic region is quite limited because all the companies here have to compete for the money with the global global companies. Uh, we also don't go into really early stage biotechs. We have to have at least proof proof of concept in human. Uh, we have tried to bring some of the really early stuff to our scientific advisory board, and they just say, "Oh, come back when you have some human data that we can analyze." A lot of a lot of companies have actually cured mice, but uh, it's another thing to cure a human. Uh, and if you look what we have in the Nordic region, obviously we have a position in Novo Nordisk, a great company. We also have exposure in Oncopeptides, which is actually actually one of our largest holdings. And I think they have they are in a great position. They, as you know, they have now filed for approval in the US for their novel multiple myeloma drug. And I think they are quite unique that they are going head to head against pomalidomide uh, and that study will read out uh, early next year and they could actually get approval now before year end so exciting times for them and they are building out now the sales force in the US market for a hopeful approval before year end so uh, that's a company we really like at this point of stage and we think it's quite de-risked actually. And that's always a good thing. Uh, Matthias, uh, I know that uh, Ruber Merica also has exposure to a, a few Nordic companies. Is that right? Would you like to elaborate on that? Sure, sure we do. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I'd raise uh, one of them <clears throat> that uh, is, is still um, a bit under the radar for many investors. It's, it's, a, it's a Danish company called Chemometek. We like to invest in trends um, that uh, that not, not necessarily involve the company that takes most of the development risk, but those who supplies, uh, you know, uh, the tools uh, for that research to be able to proceed. And um, cell therapy and gene therapy is, is obviously um, making inroad to <clears throat> being commercialized right now. A number of um, you know, therapies has been approved and, and many more than 
uh, you know, hundreds of them are in development. And Kimimetek uh, is, is, is one of the leaders in uh, cell counting and precise such robust uh, cell counting, which is increasingly important if you go from basic research to actually therapies where, uh, you know, you can't afford to have um, uh, the incorrect number of uh, cells being infused to a patient, which can be the difference between, you know, either lack of efficacy or a, a safety concern. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, a broad client base, uh, all the uh, biopharma uh, companies involved in developing that and uh, with, with a very scalable business model uh, illustrated by high gross margins, but also now, uh, you know, expanding EBITDA margins. So it's one of those names that's done well the last couple of years, but, uh, you know, still is, is, is fairly under researched and, and uh, below the radar for many companies or uh, and investors. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, and Klaus, uh, you mentioned that you have a very close eye on the well on the COVID-19 vaccine race and uh, the competition there. Um, do you feel like uh, we will be able to pick a winner of that race anytime soon, or is it uh, is it perhaps the uh, messaging RNA companies in general that will be the the winner the future winners. What do you think? A little bit uh, too early uh, to to call a winner, but it's definitely very very exciting um, efficacy data that we have seen from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech. Um, we still uh, need to see how Johnson Johnson and AstraZeneca, Novavax, and um, definitely a lot of other companies report data next year. So, uh, so far we've seen some good data. Now we have to get a good look into the safety database, how these vaccines work in the elderly population. And also we have to know a little bit about how long is it actually going to protect the uh, population that will be vaccinated. And then we will monitor very closely how these companies have been able to scale up production. We've already seen Pfizer reducing uh, the production volume for this year. Uh, from 100 million doses to 50 million doses. So that was quite a sharp reduction. So it means that there is still uh, some hurdles that these companies need to um, to pass. And we will have to monitor all the clinical data. Uh, it's a tough job to do, but we have to monitor the data and look into the safety and, and see how this involves. So it's definitely um, a race that you have to keep an eye on for 2021 as these uh, companies will both produce a large volume to, to the rest of the world. And we also need to monitor how these vaccines will actually be distributed in the low income countries. So we can actually have an effective opening of the whole uh, global economy. You can, you can expect uh, US and Europe to uh, vaccinate uh, next year, uh, US probably starting this year, but then you can see a gradual opening starting with the health, healthcare workers being vaccinated and then probably the elderly population and then the the healthy uh, adults like us. But that will take some time. So we'll probably get into uh, 2022 before actually the whole population has been vaccinated. So we, we have to uh, expect the gradual opening up uh, for 2021. So but it's exciting times. And uh, let's cross our fingers that we have very efficacious vaccines. Indeed, uh, we're crossing our fingers and our toes for that. Uh, so uh, we are running out of time. So I would like to uh, ask each and one of you very briefly to name then the, the biggest risk uh, looming over the market for the upcoming year uh, that the investors should, uh, should stay, um, stay alert on. Uh, let's start with you, Matthias. Okay, sure. Um, I, I was hoping you to pick the others, and then I come with something contrarian <laughs> here. But, but uh, you know, I, I, maybe some of the following speakers will talk about uh, you know risks with the, the vaccine development and what have you. I, I'm actually more focused on uh, you know, uh, although we, we, we don't tend to think about us as, as macro investors, but uh, you know, if you want to be talking about risk, of course, that comes in the macro perspective. And um, empl employment data uh, is, is typically what uh, can cause a cycle to, to turn, so to say. So obviously we have uh, many people on the street is, 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 is a bit uh, confused why this market is on all time high, while there is uh, looming unemployment and difficulties around uh, societies. Obviously the market has been looking 
through the pandemic and now also help with the vaccine data. But, uh, you know, if, 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 if there continues to be a disconnect, then here in Europe we have clearly our second wave ongoing now. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of support from governments and what, what have you, fiscal policy and so on. But that, that's something that, um, you know, uh, needs to uh, be monitored uh, closely because if, if that sort of uh, has a sustained disconnect with what the market is pricing in, that, that, then eventually that can be problematic. So I'm not going to go into long-term interest rates or, or, or safety risk with the vaccines, but I'm going to point to employment because in the end of the day, that needs to be connected with what's going on in the market. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, as you were hoping to come out last, I was hoping for a slightly shorter answer. So that <laughs> took up most of the rest of our time. Uh, but uh, Mikael, uh, very, very, very briefly, what would you consider the biggest <laughs> risk for the upcoming year? And I mean very briefly. Yeah, I'll be very short. Yeah, as Matthias said, the long term uh, effects of the vaccines, we don't know the long term if, if there are any side effects that could be dealt to the market and the reopening. And then also, I think a risk that people are not really looking into right now is that the US election is not a done deal yet. You have a Senate race, which looks to be Republican winning that. It's 50-48 right now, but it's quite important for the healthcare sector that uh, we have a split Congress and uh, with Biden as president, because if uh, the Democrats take all three, uh, then you could see some legislation and pricing pressure on drugs in the future. So that's what I keep an eye on. Short and sweet. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned the American election results and uh, actually had that as a backup question if we would have time to spend. But uh, I think that will be an entirely different panel. Uh, Klaus, yeah. you, be the, you have the final word here. What are you looking, what are you on the outlook for or avoiding in 2021? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, we're actually looking into 2022, how we think the market could evolve, uh, both in terms of volume and procedures. Um, but I think you have to pay attention to any drug uh, price reform, any, let's say, redistribution of rebates in the U.S. healthcare system. I think you have to monitor a tax reform could happen in U.S. Um, I think there is, of, of course, also the, um, the risk that this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, mutated itself, so we will have uh, less efficacious vaccines. So I think there's a lot of uh, a few uh, things to monitor in going into 2021. Uh I would like to say thank you very much for taking the time to participate here today. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll uh, get an opportunity to chat soon again. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having Thanks, us. Thank you very much.